On Panorama tonight, we investigate the money going into our political parties. It's in their interest not to look too hard, and it's lucrative to not look hard if you're good at raising the money. Our evidence raises serious questions about the funding of our democracy. The gravest threat at the moment is the purchase of our political system by the super-rich. Leaked documents expose financial secrets of big donors to the Conservative Party. In this report, it says, we relied very much on the services of Mr XY. Who is Mr XY? That is Mahmoud Amarsi. Are the rules on political donations up to the job? Come and have supper with the Prime Minister. Come and have supper with the leader of the opposition. What is really important is the access and the influence. But that's what is always on sale, isn't it? It's the time of year when political parties get together. But where their money comes from is not on the agenda. Parties can take as much as they like, so long as the donor is on the electoral roll or is a UK company doing business here. You would have thought that there should be some sort of obligation placed on them in law to inquire a little bit into where that large sum of money comes from. In fact, there is nothing like that, nothing at all. We've been investigating political donors. First up is Mohammed Amersi. He's very well connected here he is, talking about corruption. Corruption is a very, very heinous crime. Every stolen dollar robs the poor of an equal opportunity in life. You might have heard of Mr. Amersi because he recently revealed he paid for meetings with Prince Charles. But we're interested in the money he's given to the Conservative Party. More than half a million pounds. The campaign is over and the work begins. Thank you all very much. £10,000 went to Boris Johnson's leadership campaign. His cash also bought him face time with leading Conservatives. Critics say this kind of access damages democracy. What is completely fascinating under Boris Johnson's Conservative Party is that if you give enough, you're having dinner with the Prime Minister. You meet the top chap, the, the Prime Minister or various cabinet ministers, and you get access. It's crony capitalism. It's capitalism for the super rich. We've been looking at Mohammed Amersi's past and where his money comes from. Well, some of it comes from this company in Sweden. A company fined almost a billion dollars for bribery. Tellier employed Mr Amersi as a consultant. He earned big fees for helping them structure telecoms deals in some notoriously corrupt countries. Like Uzbekistan. In 2007, Telia worked with Gulnara Karimova, the daughter of the then president of Uzbekistan. Her family, the Karamovs, had a reputation for corruption. 
in order to gain access to the Golden Goose, there was a gatekeeper, and that gatekeeper was the eldest daughter of the president. Gulnara Karimova ran a um, racket in Uzbekistan. It was an organised crime racket. And if you want to make a load of money, you had to go and be her business partner. Telia became Gulnara Karimova's partner by giving shares to an offshore shell company she secretly controlled. Three years later, Telia bought most of the shares back for $220 million. The American authorities say this was a $220 million bribe. We've now obtained documents that show how Mr. Amersi was involved in the deal. In one email, Telia boss writes, I do not want to be involved in the day-to-day -day negotiations so maybe you can handle it. Mr. Amersi responds, sure, I agree. And here's Mr. Amersi's invoice for his part in Project Uzbekistan. He got a success fee of $500,000 for his work. The problem that Mr. Amersi faces is that he has received money for being in the middle of um, a structure between the Swedish telecoms company and the shell company in which the president of Uzbekistan's daughter um, had a full role. Mr. Amersi's lawyers said the offshore company had been vetted and approved by Telia. Its involvement did not raise any red flags to Mr. Amersi. His only role was helping Tellier buy the shares back. Tellier has accepted responsibility for violating anti-corruption laws. We've also seen evidence about how Mr. Amersi was involved in other Telia deals. We've got details of an internal report about a consultant referred to as Mr. XY, who was paid more than $65 million by Telia over six years. It says Mr. XY's services appear to have included arranging introductions to politically exposed persons that's politicians and people linked to them. We relied very much on the services of Mr XY. Who is Mr XY? That is Mohammed Amersi. So if we say, if we see Mr. XY, that is Mohammed Amersi. Yes. That's important, isn't it? Because some of the things in there are pretty shocking. So Mr. XY, so Mr. Amersi, was paid in excess of $65 million. The amount was brought up, I believe, as a big red flag, because the answer and the explanation to that was that that is normal if you pay an investment bank. But you see, Mohammed Amersi wasn't an investment bank, so that was really not a good answer. Mr. Amersi's payments included expenses for lavish corporate entertainment. They were usually between $100,000 and $200,000 a month and were not evidenced by copies of receipts. The internal report recommended Tellier's relationship with Mr. Amersi be terminated. They're basically saying the way that Mr. Amersi yes. behaved was unacceptable yes. Yes. and they had to let him go. Because if I had not thought that, I would not have thought that that was an agreement that should be terminated and that there was a high level of risk with it. All this matters because Mr. Amersi's cash has been funding the Conservative Party. I think they should give it back. 
I think if serious questions are being asked about the donor, they should give it back. And the bottom line is they don't have to, and there's nothing in the law or the regulation of our system that compels them to do that. Mr Amersi's lawyers said he met senior political figures with Tellier managers, but only dealt with individuals who were not considered politically exposed persons by mainstream institutions. His fees and expenses were entirely in keeping with industry practice, and that Tellier did not require regular sight of the receipts. They say it's entirely false to suggest his contract was terminated. It is important that people around him, that trust him, that listen to him, understand the whole context of his career and wealth. He has been involved in one of the biggest corruption scandals that we have seen in Sweden in modern times. Mr. Amersi is in the Pandora Papers. 12 million leaked documents that were obtained by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists from a secret source. They want this information to come to the attention of governments all over the world. More than 600 journalists have worked on the leak, including Panorama and The Guardian in the UK. We checked who else in the Pandora Papers has been giving money to the UK's main political parties. It led to stories about other Conservative Party donors. What could be more English than this? The village of Yulm in the Oxfordshire countryside, with its church, its pub and its stately homes. But the residents of Yulm Down House grew up a long way from here. The files show that this is the country estate of another Tory donor. It belongs to Lubov Chinookin and her husband Vladimir. Now we're going to tell you about Mr Chinookin's money. But before that, we need to talk about his wife. Lubov Chinookin has given almost two million pounds to the Conservatives. That's bought her time with three Tory Prime Ministers, including Boris Johnson. Two million pounds is a lot of money for the Conservative Party. Almost nothing, I suspect, for Lubov Chinookin. I have enormous respect for Tory members. I wonder what they think of all of this, that there's a group of incredibly rich people who are paying astronomical sums of money to get very privileged access at the highest level to the Prime Minister and to ministers. So where do Mrs Chinookin's donations to the Conservative Party come from? Our documents tell us Mrs. Chinookin's wealth comes from Mr. Chinookin. One email describes her as financially supported by her husband. Another as a housewife. And this document shows Mr. Chinookin's offshore company loaned four million pounds to a company owned by his wife in the UK. 
It looks like cash that's gone to the Conservative Party originally came from Mr Chinookin. I would start to ask myself why he is not identified as a donor. If it's joint money, if it's family money, why isn't he willing to have his name alongside hers in the quarterly return to the Electoral Commission, publicly identified as a donor and the source of the money? Why? The Chinookin's lawyer said, Mrs Chinookin is a British citizen and is entitled to do as she wishes with her money. But what about the money itself? Vladimir Chinookin came to London in 2004 after falling out of favour with President Putin. He made a fortune in Russia before he met his wife. Vladimir Chinookin was a deputy finance minister in the Yeltsin era. And then in 2000, when Putin first came to the presidency, he became head of one of Russia's biggest state banks. We found evidence that suggests Mr. Chinookin abused his position at the state bank to make money for himself. It's based on something he said in court here in the UK in 2018. We've got hold of a transcript. It's from a vicious legal dispute over a Russian property development. In it, Mr Chinookin is surprisingly open about how he went about his business and how he got what he wanted. Mr Chinookin had a secret personal interest in this multi-million pound development in Moscow. In the court case, he described how he came to an arrangement with the then mayor of Moscow, Yuri Lushkov. The mayor would give him planning permission, and in return, Mr. Chanukin would use the bank's powers to help enrich the mayor's family. This is what Mr. Chanukin said in court. As part of our negotiations or agreement with them how to proceed, we agreed that I will help them and Mr Lushkov will help me. It looks like a corrupt deal. The Chinookin's lawyers said our interpretation of the court evidence was a gross mischaracterization and the suggestion that he acted improperly whilst an official of the state is wholly untrue. Mr Chinookin has not accumulated his wealth in a corrupt manner. Our expert doesn't agree. That's a conflict. There's no two ways about it. Here is a man who's chairman of the bank using the, 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 the bank as a means by which he enhances his own personal wealth. Um, that, that has uh, corruption written all over it. So, why might someone give large sums of money to a political party? Could they be trying to buy influence? We've been looking into the background of a Russian businessman behind a controversial project near Portsmouth. France is 100 miles across the Channel. Now, later this month, the UK government will decide whether or not to approve an ambitious plan to link the two with an underwater energy and communication cable. It is a £1.2 billion project, but not everyone around here likes it. I'm very worried about the environmental impact. I'm worried about the environmental impact on the only inner city nature reserve that we have. But that is not the only controversy. 
The company behind the proposed undersea cable is called Aquind. Since the project began in 2015, the business has given £700,000 to the Conservative Party. Lord Callanan served as a director of Aquind before he became the Minister for Corporate Responsibility. Tory peer Lord Wharton was an advisor to the firm. Some of the business's donations went to 34 Conservative MPs. The reason this matters is that Aquin wants to lay a power cable under the channel. And you have to ask yourself why in those circumstances Aquin feels it needs to go to such elaborate efforts and spend such money and so much time to get access to the Conservative Party. I'm worried about cronyism. I'm worried about sleaze. And they're all there in this project, in my view. Aquind couldn't have a more well-connected public face. Alexander Tomurko started his career in the Russian arms industry. He's now a British citizen, a Tory activist, and a close friend of Boris Johnson. He likes to call Boris Johnson by his real first name, Alexander, or by the Russian diminutive of that, Sasha. And they call each other Sasha. He's told me about how he spent time drinking champagne with uh, Mr. Johnson on his balcony in, in Westminster in the Houses of Parliament. Mr. Tomurko has also personally donated more than £700,000 to the Conservative Party. Lawyers representing Mr. Tomurko and Aquind said the donations were entirely lawful, properly declared, and have not been made in return for any special treatment. They said the environment has been fully considered during the planning process. but it is another Russian businessman who owns Aquind. Viktor Fedotov stays away from the spotlight, but his secrets are in the files. The total length of our trunk pipelines is over 68,000 kilometers. They reveal he made a fortune from a project that was mired in allegations of corruption. An oil pipeline in eastern Siberia. Transnift is the world's largest pipeline company, one of the most important infrastructure systems in Russia. The pipeline was built by Transneft, a company owned by the Russian state. In 2008, an audit report suggested the company had lost huge sums to corruption. Transneft was paying unnecessary intermediaries tens of millions of dollars for services uh, that they, the, these intermediaries couldn't provide. So in our calculation, $4 billion was stolen or misappropriated. Our documents reveal how Mr. Fedotov and two Transnef managers secretly owned one of Transnef's contractors. It's alleged the contractor was paid for doing work that was actually done by Transnef itself. The profits were funneled through a series of offshore companies before ending up in three trusts. Two were controlled by the Transnef managers, the third by Mr. Fedotov. It looks like they use their secret trusts to siphon off more than a hundred million dollars of Transnef's money. If people are able to construct a scheme whereby they can extract 
for doing nothing, a hundred million dollars plus out of government funds, then the real loser are the men, women and children who rely on the government to give them education, health, roads, social services. Lawyers for Aquind said there was no evidence that funds were embezzled from Transneft. They say official investigations refuted the findings of the original audit. Mr. Fedotov denies any allegations of wrongdoing. He says he's never had any interest in British politics and has operated in an open and transparent manner throughout the course of his career. We think some of Mr. Fedotov's money from Transneft has ended up here in the UK. By 2007, Mr. Fedotov had been granted British citizenship and he was living in this £7 million house in the English countryside. We think money from Transnef helped pay for it. His cash has also funded Aquind and its cross-channel cable project. The decision on Mr. Fedotov's project will be made by the business secretary in days. The Conservative Party said donations are properly and transparently declared and compliance checks are made in line with legislation enacted by the last Labour government. It said fundraising is a legitimate part of the democratic process. Government policy is in no way influenced by donations and the party is motivated by the priorities of the British public acting in the national interest. The main political parties, including Labour and the Liberal Democrats, have all faced calls to hand donations back. The question is, if you're a political party in government, why aren't you recognising the risk that there's a connection between the money you're receiving and the person who's giving that money? Why do you think they're not? It's in their interest not to look too hard, and it's lucrative to not look hard if you're good at raising the money. The Pandora Papers have helped expose the murky world of political donations. Britain is living through a moment of acute political crisis at the moment, and democracy is threatened in all kinds of different ways, and fair dealing in government. But I think the gravest threat at the moment is the purchase of our political system by the super rich. Trust and transparency are vital in our politics. But how can we trust political donations if we don't know where the money's really coming from? You can catch up with the first part of Richard Bilton's Panorama investigation into the offshore secrets of the rich and powerful in Pandora Papers' Secrets of World Leaders Exposed on BBC iPlayer.